Hello and welcome to the service for Clement Parish Church, Sunday, April the 11th. My name's Gordon Palmer, a minister here, and I'll be taking part in the service as well as myself. Tom Gordon will be doing the Bible reading and Dave McLaren will be doing the prayers for others. The writer to the Hebrews says, Since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. A great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, whose sufferings we were thinking about fairly recently through, through Lent and into the Easter Passion, not simply risen from the dead, but ascended into the very presence of God himself. So the hymn, Look ye saints, the sight is glorious. Let us pray and we'll gather up our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer. You'll see the words on the screen of the forms that, of the prayer that we, we use. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are greater than our minds can imagine. You're sovereign over history. You rule over all. The creator of the ends of the earth. And you yet so big, so magnificent, and yet you have time for each, for every one of us. In Jesus, you shared our humanity, embraced the smallness, the fragility of our existence. Then, Lord, after his resurrection, that same Jesus carried that fragility, that smallness of his humanity into the glory of your presence. And so you are both mighty and yet one who is able to 
understand and has sympathy with us. You are all good. There is no ulterior motive. You are all true. There is no hidden deceits, no things that you keep away from us, no skeletons in any cupboard. You are all holy, righteous, and pure in every way. Righteous in seeking justice and, and fairness. You are, Lord God, the source of love and the, the fount of knowledge, and the one who gives meaning to life and the universe. Almighty God, these things are it's too big, too great for us to understand, too incredible for us to take in. And yet, you draw close. And yet, we marvel at your grace and rejoice in your goodness and offer our worship through Jesus Christ our Lord. Day after day, you show us mercy accepting our feeble faith and our hesitant discipleship, helping us to renew and to start again. And then no, no matter how often we fail you, your patience is never exhausted and your love refuses to be denied. We deserve so little, but you give so much. Our love is so weak, and yet your response to us is so rich and all-embracing. Gracious God, one who can sympathize with our weakness, as the writer to the Hebrews says, we come to you not just asking for sympathy, but for forgiveness. And we ask, gracious God, that you will now assure us of the pardon that there is in and through Christ, in whose name we pray, and in whose words we say, Our Father in heaven. Verses 1 to 11. Jesus taken up to heaven. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and began to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered round him. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times and dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside him. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Amen. 
Well, it's been many, many a year since I've watched an episode of uh, A Question of Sport. They, they used to have this uh, thing and programme, I don't know if they've still got it, where it was, what happened next? They would show a clip of some um, sporting event and then they would freeze it at the key moment and you had to work out what happened next. I suppose it's a kind of tactic that's employed as well by many another TV programme, a lot of soaps or drama series. They get to the end of an episode and they try to leave you with something that's hanging, something that's just suddenly thrown at you and so that you think, well, what happens next? And I need to watch the next episode. I need to tune in again. Sometimes the what happened next is not done in that terms of anticipation or excitement, just simply, well, what comes next? We've done such and such or we've got to such and such a place. Well, what happens now? What do we do? Now, an increasing number of people in our society, I think, don't know that Easter has got something to do with Jesus. And it's an even bigger number, I'm sure, who would not be able to answer the question, what happened next? After Jesus came out of the tomb, after Jesus was risen from the dead, what happened next? We're not even saying to folks, or wouldn't be saying to folks, what do you believe? We'd be saying, what do Christians think happened next? And I suspect that um, many a person would be stumped by that. I mean, clearly there's not some guy kicking around the Middle East today, going around Galilee, who's 2,000 years old. What happened next after he had risen from the dead? Well, in our services uh, here, we've used um, for a while now the Apostles' Creed, not because it is traditional to do so or whatever, but simply because in the Creed we are rehearsing, going over the main details, the main story of the Christian faith. And it tells a story that goes beyond the resurrection of Jesus and speaks of his ascending to be with the Father, speaks of the presence of the Holy Spirit with us and the here and now, and speaks too of a time when Jesus will come again at the end of time to judge the world. And in the few weeks after Easter, that's what I want to focus on, that firstly the ascension, then next week the gift of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Spirit here and now, and then in the week after the return of Jesus in the second coming. Not so much what happened next as what happened, the ascension, what is happening, the Spirit with us now, and what is still to happen, Jesus' return. Now, even after the resurrection, Jesus' disciples were still at a bit of a loss. We are told in verse 3 of the reading that Tom read for us in Acts chapter 1 that Jesus gave, appeared to the disciples uh, over a period of 40 days and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. And he appeared from time to time, and we're not told, but I wonder if the disciples were kind of thinking, it'd be good if Jesus turned up a bit more often than he does. And maybe they, maybe they went back to the upper room where Jesus made that first appearance at, um, uh, after the resurrection. Maybe they went back to the upper room and kicked Thomas out because they said, first time Jesus came, Thomas, you weren't here, so let's... Maybe, maybe some of them just walked back and forward, the road up to Emmaus, Jerusalem to Emmaus, up and down, because Jesus, Luke 24, had drawn beside um, disciples then. Maybe they went back to places, no, thinking, I wish we had a wee bit more of Jesus. I wish we could have him around a bit more often. Because they were struggling, and they still misunderstood, and we, we get a, just an ex sense of the extent of their misunderstanding in verse 6 of our reading. They gathered round Jesus and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They thought that was a reasonable question, but it's, there's at least three mistakes in there. One, they thought the kingdom of God was some kind of earthly power. Restore the kingdom. That is, is Israel going to get its status back? Is it going to be a powerful nation again? Are we going to have economic uh, prosperity? Are we going to have security as, as a nation? Are you going to restore that? Is it a this world kingdom? Whereas Jesus when he's taught about the kingdom of God, and he still was doing that, verse 3 throughout this, he wasn't speaking about an earthly kingdom and a kingdom that was established through the world's power and strength. 
And then they thought, secondly, that the kingdom was for the likes of them. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? That is, are we getting it back? But the kingdom was not for one nation or one group of people or one kind of person. It was to be for all, verse 8. Jesus was going to send them to the ends of the earth. And then thirdly, and lastly, they thought the kingdom was going to be established on earth right away. Lord, are you at this time? But the kingdom, while established in and through the work of Jesus, was going to be given time to grow, to be nurtured, to spread throughout the earth. Clearly, if they, they were going to be Jesus' witnesses to the ends of the earth, verse 8, that was going to take a while. And in passages such as the parable of the wheat and the weeds in Matthew chapter 13, we see that that, that time for the gospel to grow was being given. The theme of the kingdom of God was there from the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And it's a theme that continues right into this book. Luke, who wrote the Acts of the Apostles, begins this story making connections with what he'd written before, that is the Gospel of Luke. He emphasizes the, the connection, the continuing nature of the story, in that um, his Gospel, chapter 24, finishes with the story of Jesus ascending. And here, in chapter 1 of Acts, he goes back to that story. There's a continuity. And yet, as well as the continuity of the same story, there was going to be a shift. There was going to be a gear change. Something was going to be different from this point on. Jesus was no longer going to be with the disciples in bodily form. They were to go to the ends of the earth, verse 8. And clearly they couldn't do that and have Jesus with them in bodily form. They couldn't go to Samaria and be in Rome and be in Malta all at the same time and have Jesus with them in each of these places. And the ascension was underlining the fact that Jesus was not going to be around with them in the body. The cloud, verse 7, was significant not because it was above the disciples in the sky and that was the direction was Jesus was going in, heaven up there. The significance of the cloud, verse 7, is that in the Old Testament, God's glory was frequently referred to as being masked by a cloud. Jesus is taking our humanity. He is taking his flesh into the very presence of God. The point is that he's going to share the Father's glory, and he's going to share that glory as one of us. And the other important point is that here is a withdrawal of Jesus from the disciples. Here is Jesus' bodily form being removed. And here we have some portrayal of that. Because if there hadn't been the ascension, if there hadn't been some portrayal of that change, I suppose the disciples might well have expected Jesus still to turn up on the Emmaus Road or the upper room or so on. So both in his teaching... And then in the visible sign of the ascension, Jesus was making it plain that things were not going to go on like that. He was going away. And he was going to send a replacement, verse 8, the Holy Spirit. But before the coming, coming to the gift of the Spirit, and we'll look at that next week, I want to emphasize these two points about the ascension. Firstly, Jesus took our humanity with him. When Jesus ascended to the Father, he was not returning just like we might after we'd been away for a while. You know, we'd gone away on a holiday, do you remember? We used to be able to go away for holidays. Um, you know, and when you came back from the holiday, you were pretty much the same. Maybe a, some bit of a suntan or something like that. Maybe your wallet or purse was a lot lighter or, or whatever. But basically, we went back to life as it had been before the holidays. That's not what's happening here. Jesus' return to heaven is much more uh, like the, 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 a, a team coming back with a trophy. It's much more like the, the open-top bus going through the, the city. Jesus would arrive, and, and the, the, the angels would be cheering, and the, the trophy that Jesus held up was the salvation of people, the salvation of the family of God. Jesus could hold that up, in a sense, as the angels cheered and rejoiced. 
He returned as a victorious saviour. He came back in triumph. And he was, took that into the very presence of God, Hebrews chapter 9, and also in chapter 4, the verses we read at the beginning of the service. He is in the presence of the Father on our behalf. So it's not that he goes to the temple to pray for us once in a while. It's not that he turned up at the Father's throne to put in a good word for us. He is there as a saviour. And in the presence of God, the verses in Hebrews 4 that we began with, in the presence of God, we have one who understands, one who sympathizes, one who has shared our lot. His wounds and his scars are there testimony to what he has borne for us. He is not so far removed from the human condition that he doesn't know anything about life struggles, life hardships, life temptations. Now, we understand people best, don't we, if we have shared realities and shared experiences with them. And here's the, some of the glory of the gospel that the risen Jesus who is now, is now permanently united with us in our humanity. He is with the Father interceding for us. Those of you who are parents, have you ever stood at the door of the house and, and said to your kids as they try and come in, you're not coming into the house with all these guys, or you're not coming into the house with that, take, that, take these shoes off or, or whatever. You're not coming... There is no chance that God is going to stand at the door of eternity and say, you can't come in with humanity. You can't come in looking like that. You can't come in. Jesus has taken that humanity right into the very presence of God. And secondly, Jesus' ascension points out to his disciples, makes it clear that we are the body of Christ. The Apostle Paul was later to talk of the church of the body of Christ. And I think if there hadn't been the ascension here, the thought would never have occurred to Jesus' followers. Had Jesus not been so clearly and so specifically removed in bodily form, it would never have occurred to his followers that they were Christ's eyes to look in compassion on the miseries of people, that they were Christ's hands to leap out in mercy to help, that they were Christ's feet to take the message into all the ends of the earth. It took his departure in this dramatic way to underline for these first disciples and for us that they, that we are Jesus' representatives, that they, that we, are Jesus' body here on earth. And so, as in the, his body, Jesus takes his leave, he says to his followers, he says to the church, you continue this work. It's the same message, the same gospel. It's the kingdom of God that is to be proclaimed and shown. And so the church's origins and aims are not in the aspirations of people, not in what we would like. That is the mistake that the disciples made, verse 6. And similar errors are around today. Too often just the talk is about earthly kingdoms, and too much the church has relied on political power and status. Too often, just as they thought the kingdom was going to be for people like them, too often the church has become a club that is for the interest of its own members. And just as they thought it was something that was going to happen immediately, too often the church has imagined that the gospel is just about solving our issues and sorting things out for us here and now. These three mistakes are recurring temptations and errors that have blighted and continue to blight the church. It would be far better if there was more of a searching, questioning attitude amongst Christ's people that made us ask hard questions about our role, about our calling, and, and how we fulfill that role. For the church's origins are in this appointment of Jesus to his people that they are his body, that they are his people. As he takes the, his leave in the flesh, he says, over to you. Now, as the story continued in the book of Acts, yes, there were evangelists, yes, there were apostles, but th the word was being spread through by all the people. It was as they, as they moved out, the people were all witnesses to Jesus. 
for he has no other body on earth apart from the church. He has not instituted any plan B. And that task of being his witnesses is what he has given the church to do. So what happened next? Freeze the picture as Jesus is with the um, disciples here in Acts chapter 1. What happens next is that Jesus leaves from, from them. He takes his humanity into the very glory and presence of the heavenly Father, so that right there in the throne room of grace itself, we have one who understands, one who feels, one who sympathizes, and one who was tempted like us, but who overcame. And then secondly, we have the point made that that work of Jesus is passed on to us. Now, as we've said, there'll be the look at how the presence of the Spirit is to be with us and help us in that task. But the point remains that this is the church's origin, this is the church's calling and beginning, to be the body of Christ, to be Jesus' ears and eyes and hands and feet and heart and legs and everything else in the world today. It's not, verse 6, about power, but about service. It's not just about for the likes of us, but for, for everyone. And it's not just about material wealth and benefit here and now, but the glory of eternity and the values and priorities of the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for all that Jesus bore for us, all that Jesus went through on our behalf. And thank you that he remains steadfast we thank you that he remains set on the calling that you had given him. And we thank you for that triumphant return that he would have had into your heavenly presence. And we pray that we might learn to share in the fruits of that victory, both experiencing and understanding the closeness of Jesus with us and through Jesus our closeness with you but also, too, understanding the role, the commission, the call that we have been given to be the people of God, to be the reality of Jesus, loving, caring, and serving in the world today. Lord, help us to do that faithfully and fruitfully to your glory. Amen. A hymn that celebrates the triumph of Jesus and the Savior die but rose again. And after we sung this hymn, they shared together in the um, Confession of Faith in the Apostles' Creed, then Dave McLaren is going to be leading us in our prayers for others. And after David has led us in our prayers, we finish our service with Jesus is the name we honor and the grace that we share together. God bless you.
The Saviour died, but rose again triumphant from the grave, and pleads our cause at God's right hand, omnipotent to save. Our God and Father, we thank you that we have not only an omnipotent Saviour, an unlimited Saviour, but also an advocate who pleads our cause and pleads also his blood. And we thank you that through his dying and rising, we can have access to you, that we too can be raised to the heavenly places. Who then can e'er divide us more from Jesus and his love, or break the sacred chain that binds the earth to heaven above? Father, we pray for those situations where efforts are being made to separate people from your love. Places such as North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, Nigeria, Yemen, Iran, where believers are being ostracized, punished, persecuted, encouraged to deny the truth of the gospel. But we think too of situations where the persecution is more subtle. A comment here, a restriction there. Help us to hold on to your promise that nothing in all creation can separate us from your love. Help us to resist the devil and watch him flee. Let troubles rise and terrors frown and days of darkness fall. Through him all dangers will defy and more than conquer all. Seems, Lord, that we've been living in days of darkness, locked up, separated from one another because of a, a tiny virus. We thank you for the progress that's been made in developing vaccines and the resulting reduction in hospital admissions and deaths. We do believe we're moving from darkness into light. But we're aware of folks in our community who are scared, scared to cross the doorstep, scared to meet up with others, scared of becoming ill, scared that things will never return to normal. Father, may we be a part of their recovery. May we be used to talk to them, care for them, visit them, encourage them and help them to come out into the light. Nor death, nor life, nor earth, nor hell, nor time's destroying sway can any faces from his heart or make his love decay. We pray too, Lord, for those whose hearts have been saddened by the death of someone close and dear to them. For members of our family who have died and whose anniversary we recall, may, they, may we experience the comfort of your Holy Spirit within us and the strength and fellowship of the church family around us. Each future period he will bless as he has blessed the past. He loved us from the first of time. He loves us to the last. And we pray these things in the confidence that you are the same yesterday, today, forever. We pray these things in the confidence that your love for us does not waver. We pray these things in the confidence that you hear our prayers and you will answer them. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen.